Grace and peace to you. Good morning. Welcome to you all. It's nice to see you. This is a bit of a hardcore crew. Nice to see you. If you're visiting this morning, you're especially hardcore, and we are really glad you're here. Uh, No matter who you are, no matter where you are on this journey, you are welcome here just as you are. This is an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. When the doors open, they open to everyone. We also say good morning and welcome to those of you watching the service on local television, and we wish you God's peace. We do gather downstairs after worship for a time of fellowship and refreshment. Uh, Please join us if you're able. And as we've been doing for the past uh, two Sundays, I believe, we'll do again today. This will be the last chance to make sure that your name and address and phone number contact information is correct for the new directory. Uh, Bonnie Stevens is in the back pew there. Uh, Bonnie, why don't you stand up so all, all can see you. This is the person you want to see. She will, if you don't go downstairs or are unable to go downstairs uh, today, she will uh, be available in the back of the sanctuary on your way out, and then she'll be downstairs uh, afterwards. Uh, our new light service will be our Teze worship, as we do on the last Sunday of every month. A lovely service of music and candlelight and prayer. Our Monday noontime Bible study uh, has been launched. We met last Monday. We're meeting every other week, so uh, in this coming week we will be reading privately the book of Hosea and discussing it next Monday. And James Davis's adult study, Religion and Politics, uh, will have its third and final session tomorrow evening. If you're interested in becoming a member of our church, you have an opportunity to do so on April 8th. Uh, That was a tentative date, and now it's no longer tentative. It's going to happen. There are a number of people who are able to be here that day, and it'll be a pleasure and a joy, really, to, to welcome new members into our congregation on April 8th. If this is something that you would like to do, uh, just be in touch with the church office or me. Let me see. I believe that is it. There are other announcements in the bulletin, but if uh, you would join me now in a moment of silent centering prayer. Thank you.
Please join me in the call to worship. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My, my soul, soul thirsts, thirsts for God, for the, the living God. God. Show us your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths. Guide, Guide us in your truth and teach us. For you are God, our Savior, and, and our hope is in you all the day long. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and, and our, our heart, heart is restless, restless until it rests in, in you. Lent is a season in the church's life for us to practice self-examination, to take a clear, close look at our living, the decisions that we make. We do so every Sunday in this place with as much truth as we can muster, and with confidence, too, that the love of God is unconditional. which means that God loves us on our good days and on our bad ones. Would you please join me in our prayer of confession? Gracious God, you ask us to speak against injustice. We give you a whisper so as not to offend the offender. You ask for all our heart soul, mind, and strength. We give you fragments and scraps, 
For selflessness is hard. For the sin of our indifference, O God, we pray for forgiveness. By your grace, free us from a past we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. And draw us nearer to Christ, who calls us today in his luminous and demanding way to try again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Jesus says, come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Through Jesus Christ, God offers grace and peace. You are loved. You are forgiven. You belong to God. Amen. Good morning. I'd love to welcome the children forward for a message. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. How was break? Good. You ready for school tomorrow? No. Okay. <laughs> How much more break would you like? 
A lot more. Okay, fair enough. Um, what season are we in right now? Rachel. Lent. Rachel skipped right over my first question. I thought for sure you guys would say winter. What does your dad do for a living? <laughs> so, did you know that the church has seasons? Rachel does. We're in Lent. Does anybody know another season in the church? Eva. Is it Epiphany? Epiphany? Great. All right. Anybody else? Rachel. Advent. So I brought a little visual aid in to help. So if you didn't know, the church also has seasons, and it's split up a little bit differently, and we are in Lent right now. And I think the season of Advent is one you guys hear a lot about, right? What do we, what do, we do during Advent? What happens? Yeah, Margaret. Yeah, we light candles, and we're waiting and getting excited about what? What happens? Rachel. Christmas. So we're getting excited because basically we're celebrating this little guy's birthday. Who's that guy? Baby Jesus. All right, so Advent's a time of waiting, and we're waiting for the birth of Jesus because we're going to celebrate it. And we have the candles that we light. So we spend four weeks kind of thinking and talking about that. Do you guys remember what the four candles are? Can you tell me one of the candles we light? Lucy, joy, okay, Margaret, hope, Rachel, love, what's the other one, Eva, peace, all right, so we spend a lot of time, like when it's the week of hope, we spend time thinking about hope, and our prayers are about hope, and then we move on to peace, etc. so we're in Lent, and Lent's a long season also, so it starts on Ash Wednesday, which was February 14th this year, and it ends on Easter Sunday. So we spend a lot of time during those weeks also sort of praying and waiting because we're Easter is what are we celebrating for Easter? What happens on Easter that we get excited about? Mitzi. No, it's okay. I'll come back to you. Margaret. Yeah, so we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. All right? And it's a pretty important day in the life of our church and in the calendar because pretty much the greatest love story of all time. He gave up his life for us and to help us understand that love will prevail and that God's love undefeatable. Even death can't defeat God's love. So it's a pretty, pretty important thing. So I started thinking, well, what could we do during Lent that would help you guys get ready for that? And so I created this for sort of five-week journey that we can go on together. And every week you're going to get sort of an activity packet that you can use to think about Lent. I had some very nice individuals from my senior youth group come in during their vacation and spend nearly two hours assembling about 150 packets because there's different packets for each week. Do you guys want to see what some of the packets are? All right. This week, you're going to start... Nope, not that one. All right, you're each going to get one of these little packets... And it's going to be seven days of praying. And there's a little piece of paper in here that's going to help you. If you're not sure how to say a prayer, it's going to help you say a prayer. And then you get seven purple strips of paper. You ever guys make those paper chains where you link them together? So you get to make seven chain links, put them together, but on each link, you're going to write down a person or a thing that you want to pray for. And one day this week, like on Monday, you'll, you'll pray for that. 
and then you'll rip the chain off at the end of the day, and then the next day you'll pray for the next person or thing that you wrote down. So it's going to be seven days of, of really just praying, okay? Does anybody remember what our theme for the year is? What is it? Prayer. So this is great because Lent's full of prayer. All right. Do you want to know what you're going to do the next week? All right. I won't go into too much detail. I don't want to give all the surprises away. So you're going to get a little card, and inside the card are going to be some instructions, and there's going to be a little prayer in there for you. And you're going to have to think about giving something up for seven whole days. Something you really love. Not like homework and Brussels sprouts. Like, maybe you really love video games, or maybe you really love candy or cookies. I know, the looks of horror on their faces. But that's the point. Try it for seven days. There's a prayer in there to help you. Each day you can say the prayer to help you, okay? Day th- or week three, you're going to get this scroll. And inside are some instructions also. And it's going to be seven days of serving others. So there's a list of 25 different ways you can do that. You get to choose. One a day. Do more if you want. Week four, you're going to get this purple bag. And inside of it is your own Lenten cross. And you can decorate it any way you want. And you get three little candles also. And you can put it at your dinner table. And you can light it at dinner time and say the Lord's Prayer. And then the last week, you're going you're gonna to get a bookmark. And I have lots of them, different types. And there's a little bit of scripture on the back. And with your family, you're going to read one of the Gospels, sort of the Passion narrative where it talks about the Holy Week, okay, from Palm Sunday to Easter. And I give you a bookmark so you can mark your Bible. If you can memorize your scripture, I have these cool little UCC pins, and you guys can get a pin. The congregation is jealous right now. They want to participate. Do you want to participate? I put an adult version of this week's activity on the back tables so you can take one on the way out. All right? Believe it or not, Usually when I do these things, people come to me and say, well, I want to do that too. Can you give me a list of it? So it's really not just us. It's everybody. So it's like 250 of us doing this. Pretty cool? All right, so what's going to happen is I'm going to come into your classrooms. I'll give everybody their packets for this week. If you know you can't be here for the next week because you've already got something going on that just you know you can't possibly get to church, let me know, and I can give you your other one ahead of time so you don't miss out on all the fun, okay? All right, please join me in a prayer. Lord, grant us simplicity of faith and a generosity of service that gives without counting cost, a life overflowing with grace poured out from the one who gave everything that we might show the power of love to a broken world and share the truth from a living word. Lord, grant us simplicity of faith and a yearning to share it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture lessons this morning are from the letter of James, traditionally identified as James, the Lord's brother, who though not a disciple or apostle at first, became one after the resurrection and became the head of the Jerusalem church and a pillar of early Christianity. This is the book of the Bible that Lutherans love to hate because of its emphasis on works. But as you'll, well, as you might know, when Paul talked about salvation by faith alone, he meant all-encompassing trust and obedience, which is really what James is writing about also, but we'll let James speak for himself. Listen for the word of God. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. <laughs> show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. Amen. For a letter that is so focused on works and doing the word, it comes as something of a surprise that in chapter 5 of this letter, we get this flurry of joy about the power of prayer. James writes, Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Thoughts and prayers. You are in my thoughts and prayers. I have said that many times. I have tucked those words into hundreds of notes of condolence. Maybe you have too. You are in my thoughts and prayers is not a masterpiece of human prose. 
If we say it, we say it because in the inarticulate shock of loss, we want to express empathy and compassion. There are other ways to convey this, but you are in my thoughts and prayers is one way to say, I love you and I want good for you. Thoughts and prayers. When those words are anchored in Christian community, they mean something important. Something like, I cannot wash away your pain. I cannot fix this. I cannot change the unchangeable. But I trust that God is with you, and I will do everything I can to bear the light of God's love for you as we walk this valley of shadows together. Thoughts and prayers. Over the years, the thoughts and prayers of others have comforted me, have upheld me, have encouraged me to be of good courage. But lately, those words have been thrown overboard. In the past 10 days, in the wake of another mass murder, another school shooting, I have heard 10 times a day, thoughts and prayers don't change anything. We have to take action. Well, I'm up for action. But this cry strikes me as a very narrow view of prayer. You see, I am praying for the people of Parkland. And I am praying for less gun violence in our country. These prayers are not coins inserted in a cosmic vending machine. I don't think the power of my positive thinking will bring relief to a grieving community in Florida. And I don't think my prayers will magically change the laws of our land. I pray because I need to be reminded that I am not a community of one. As Desmond Tutu says, a person is a person through other persons. So, for others, I pray. I also pray because I need help seeing the humanity of leaders whom I am finding very hard to like. I also pray because I need to express to God my very deepest needs and hopes and concerns. I also pray because I believe in a God who is bigger than the problems we face. A God who gives us strength to keep going when we are tired, weak, and worn. So I get the call to action, but I could do without the casual dismissal of prayer. Prayer is oxygen for my soul. And let me add this, I don't see prayer as an alternative to action. I don't think it's an either or. Either thoughts and prayers or action? Since when is this a choice? Faithfulness. Faithfulness has always held together thoughts and prayers and action. Always. Take the letter of James. The letter of James ends with a swooning celebration of prayer. Pray for one another. P prayer is powerful and effective, he says. But on the way to that little prayer patch in chapter 5, James keeps slowing down in front of unambiguous billboards. Look, he says, religion that is pure and undefiled is this to care for orphans and widows in their distress. 
Look, he says, faith by itself, if it has no works, if it doesn't do anything, is dead for 2,000 years, and still today, St. James reminds us to actively work for the good of others, especially those who are suffering, and to thoughtfully pray for them. In other words, he reminds us to be church. Thoughts and prayers, yes, please, bring them on. And also cards and phone calls, and deliveries of food, and altar flowers, and rides to the hospital. A couple years ago, after my shoulder surgery, a church friend brought me some homemade chicken soup with these little bread balls in there. It was incredible. It was so good. And it might have had something to do with the painkillers that I was on at the time. But to this day, that soup is the best prayer I have ever eaten. Thoughts and prayers. When those words are anchored in the harbor of Christian community, they mean something important. And they are forever tied to the action we take. To the things we do to show someone else that we care. But in recent days, those words have fallen flat in the public square. The sound of an NRA-funded politician offering thoughts and prayers after another mass murder at a school is a hollow, hollow sound. It rings hollow because it's hypocritical to pray for a problem that you are able but unwilling to resolve. And up till now, too many lawmakers have been unwilling to make comprehensive, commonsensical laws to address the problem of gun violence in this country. So many empty thoughts, so many performative prayers, so much inaction. If you say your thoughts and prayers are with someone, it means you are willing to do something for them. Otherwise, that phrase becomes something it isn't, something profane. Meanwhile, a growing crowd is gathering at the gate. A growing number of people are saying, no more intractable thinking, no more prayer for show. It's time to act, to reform our gun laws. And I am counted among that crowd. I don't have it all worked out, that's for sure. Gun law reform is complicated and I profess no mastery of the intricacies. But here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking I can't stand idly by when the spin doctors tell us that school shootings are not about the guns. Now, I agree that gun violence is not only about guns. It can be about a lot of things including mental health support and the violence on our screens that desensitizes us to real pain and suffering. But to say a school shooting is not about guns is like saying a drug overdose is not about drugs. It's just not true. I'm also of the mind that semi-automatic weapons in the hands of civilians, do not make us safer. And that universal background checks would be helpful. We might give it a try. Basically, if the goal is no more children shot dead at school, then we need to learn 
the ways of subtraction, not addition. The idea of adding guns to our schools by arming 640,000 teachers nationwide is not what I have in mind. We can do better by our kids and by one another. It's possible. Our governor, our governor showed us the other day how possible it is. Introducing sweeping gun law reform in a gun-loving state, that could not have been very easy. But it happened. It happened because something has to happen. Inaction is not an option. We have a gun problem in this country. And just because that problem is embedded in other problems doesn't mean it's not a problem. It's time to thoughtfully act. It's time to prayerfully reform our ways and our laws. Thoughts and prayers and actions. That's the three-legged race that runs from generation to generation in church. We need all three, always. And for the sake of our children, we need all three right now. Amen. God gives us many gifts. He gives us this, this beautiful creation, our home, this good green earth, and the creatures that live here, on, here with us. He gives us his love, and he offers us salvation for our sins through the death of his only son, Jesus Christ. We are gathered here today to give thanks to God and offer gifts so that this ministry may continue to grow and be a blessing to the world. 
Let us gather together our gifts and offer them to God with praise and gratitude. This morning's offering will now be received.
Let us pray. As we offer our treasures and hearts to you, O God, may they be used to pass on the gifts of peace, of hope, of life, and community to those who need your, who need your gifts and presence in their lives. Amen. Gracious God, we give you thanks for our lives and for one another. We are so grateful for the people who have loved us into being and who have nurtured us and stood by us. We celebrate Casey's vibrancy, all of his three-year-old vitality. We celebrate Mary's birthday. We celebrate Andy's journey the Tequila family's wedding. We pray that we too may express such love and support in our own lives. We thank you, God, for this time together and, and for the ways our lives are entwined in worship, in service, in learning, in prayer. We do remember our blessings and we do sing your praise. God, we hold in prayer today the ones we carry in our hearts, Hear our prayers for Bill Campbell, Doris Grimm, Marjorie Hofel, Betty Kazuba, Alice Munson, Steve's brother Chuck, Sally's sister Flo, Jennifer and Joe's good friend Calvin, and the Fuller family. God, comfort them and strengthen them by your strong presence and by our love in action. God, you've inspired people of faith before us to pour out their hearts in places of brokenness. Inspire the same in us. If we have grown callous in our dealings with others, help us to change our ways. Oh God, we know this world and our nation are groaning. Grant us wisdom and the ability to hear the cries for justice that are in line with your cries for justice. Help soften the places in us that have become hardened and open our hearts to serve you with gratitude and joy. Oh God, this room is filled with prayers. Our hearts and minds are too. So hear now in this silence the prayers we hold within us. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who teaches us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven,
Here's what I hope. I hope that the God who loves you and claims you as God's own leads you from this place with so much peace and so much love that you couldn't help but share it. There'll be more tomorrow morning. You can give it away. So go with the blessing of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen.